they want to share? communities in four states and many across the nation. Uh, the cause of this toxic water was a little ironic in the process. Um, some EPA officials were working um, on a mine up there trying to remediate some of the waste and they knocked some, words, uh, sorry, knocked some rocks down which started sort of an overflow and led to this flood to occur near Silverton, Colorado, a community of about 600 people. That's the wrong way. This is what it ended up looking like. This accidental release um, gave off about 3 million gallons of contaminated water, which included iron, aluminum, aluminum, magnesium, lead, zinc, copper, and many other metals into the Animus River, which is, as you can see, was popular for whitewater rafters and fishermen as well, really a recreation river in um, Colorado there. The response of many people, not great to the EPA. So these are some of the things that came out where people were extremely critical because it was um, EPA workers who had been working on sort of that uh, mine water and eventually triggered the release here. So this shows the length of the spill here. The reaction was swift and the reason why so many people know about it is because it spread across social media really quickly. Um, although it was very visible and people were very upset about it, the actual spill was pretty short-lived. It lasted about 10 days, and they reopened the river to recreational use. But there was a lot of concerns when it initially happened. As you can see, if you follow the Animus River down where it connects, it could have eventually ended up in Lake Powell and water systems. It would have gone through Indian reservations as well, Native American reservations. So it ended up sort of ending right at the Four Corners area. But people were really worried about this um, sort of orange sludge spreading into many different waterways from uh, the Gold King Mine, which is where it started. Um, people, as I said, were extremely upset at the EPA. The EPA sort of bore the brunt of the ire of a lot of people, both in Silverton, Colorado, and around the nation, um, because of the still, to this day, anonymous worker who sort of sparked the flood by um, being around in that mine area. However, one thing that I think is often overlooked in that process is that the mine worker might have been there, but if it hadn't been for a hundred years of extensive and intensive mining that went on there, there wouldn't have been all that orange sludge to release in the first place. So they took a lot of blame for that, but it really traces back over a hundred years of um, mining that had gone on in the area. So what I want to do is sort of put Silverton into perspective. It was a really recent, very visible experience with toxic waste um, that highlights how communities, both on the local scale and at the federal level, um, are choosing to deal with this industrialization that has happened over 100 years in America. Um, and the legacies that come out of that, both towards the environment and towards human health that we deal with now. So I want to examine the relationships between industrialization, degraded lands, economically challenged communities, and the federal government to see how Superfund plays a role in this and particularly my areas are, as you can see there, Butte and Libby as Superfund sites, and how they're working to sort of reinvent themselves or at least remain viable in the 21st century. Um, today I'm gonna to present on sort of the historical conditions that led to the creation of Superfund, the Superfund program, um, and then I'm going to discuss Superfund overall and look at it in Butte and Libby and then we'll wrap up the end and sort of open it up to questions and some things to talk about further. So this presentation is going to explore the effects of industrialization on the environment and our bodies and our attempts to remediate or mitigate these effects through technology. So American industrialization, we all remember that from school, I'm sure that time period, the industrial revolution. And um, industrialization in America really starts about the mid-19th century, give or take a few decades. 
And it starts in New England. Uh, the most uh, often remembered um, aspect is the Lowell, Massachusetts textile mills. These are what people often refer to. But you know, by the early 20th century, America is the world's leading industrial nation. So we take off quick here in America and we run with it. Um, it comes about through use of coal, oil, timber, iron, and water. And um, as we were a growing nation, we really looked to the West as a way to fulfill those resources that were needed for industrialization. We had to move people and goods. We had to work on railroads to do that. And um, we saw really the West as a place of abundant resources, um, sometimes referred to as sort of, at the time, infinite resources available to us. And um, conveniently for a lot of the people at the time, they saw it as an empty land that was devoid of anyone else there who would care if we took these resources. You know, that's not the case, but that was really sort of the image of this wild, unclaimed land that the resources were just waiting to be plucked. Um, science and technology were developed at this time to extract resources and to build new materials, and those come with both benefits and costs. So the industrialization in America, you know, it did lead to America becoming an imperial superpower. That is undeniable. Our ability to use this industrialization to grow and to grow America in a lot of different ways. We had an electrical grid. Um, we had improvements in transportation, communication, urbanization. We saw this incredible growth in America, a rise in population, and across the board, a rise in economic wealth. But if we think back to the robber barons, we definitely know it wasn't equal wealth distribution. Some people got really, really rich and lived in Fifth Avenue on, in apartments on Fifth Avenue. And some people lived in tenement buildings not too far away from there. So it was a really dis, um, wide distribution of wealth, but generally across the board, Americans got um, wealthier. The negative um, effects at this time of industrialization weren't considered um, all that negative at the time. It was really seen as um, a symbol of progress. So you hear stories about different communities where there was um, smoke from the factories, and when the factories closed down, grown men cried because it meant that the, the factory was never coming back. That idea of that representation of um, growth and progress was really represented in industrialization. The complaints that came about industrialization really came from a, more of a social Focus. So the progressive movement really criticized how the workers were treated, how they lived, um, the places, how dirty it was in cities. There's a lot of critique of that. But generally, if there were complaints about the environment, and the environment was really seen as sort of a conservationist-minded movement, and we needed to efficiently use the resources, but industrialization wasn't critiqued that heartily. Um, however, after World War II, we started to see um, the ramifications of these new forms of air and water pollution really develop. And new chemicals and materials were being developed at this time as well and impacted how we saw pollution. Um, for example, nuclear waste is something we never had to deal with before. How are we gonna interpret um, nuclear waste um, on our landscape, in our bodies? Um, the chemicals that come around when we produce plastics, these are all new things we had to deal with after the World War II or in the post-war years and really had an impact on human health and the environment. This, of course, is the time of the real rise of the environmental movement as well. And then um, we also start to see, conveniently after World War II, a number of very visible environmental disasters to sort of galvanize the public. And they start to make the same demands about how they see um, environmental health and public health at this time. Samuel Hayes, who is a historian, um, wrote that prior to 1950, more focus was on conservation and efficient use of the environment. So having logging, using um, resources efficiently. After World War II, there's a shift to appreciating <coughs> environments only if left in their quote unquote natural environment, <laughs> natural conditions. And um, we see that come around. You all I'm sure are familiar with um, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, this critique of what the pesticides we have in the air and water are doing to human bodies. All of this sort of develops in the post-war years. And as I said, we have some very visible, um, very visible environmental disasters at this time. The, one of the first being Denora, Pennsylvania in 1948. There's five days of smog. It's a steel town with lots of factories going. And the smog gets stuck in an inversion. And during that five days, there are 20 deaths that occur. This is noontime 
on one of those days, uh, but it was like at noon. The smog was so thick that the football players on the field in the game couldn't be seen by the crowd. Why they were playing football at that time is beyond me, but they couldn't see the football players <laughs> at the time. There were about 14,000 people in town at the time, and over those five days, nearly half sought medical treatment at the area hospitals. As I said, in the four or five days, over 20 people died, but over the next couple of weeks, another 50 people died connected to the smog there. This was really a turning point for how we viewed air pollution. Instead of just being an annoyance, it was something that could kill us. Um, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio, that is a river that was called the most polluted river in America. Uh, Kent State reported, uh, in a Kent State report, they noted that uh, large quantities of heavy black oil floated on it, sometimes several inches thick. Animal life did not exist in major sections of that river. And at least 13 fires were reported on that river from like 1868 to 1969. So lots of fires that occurred. Um, and this really became apparent as these fires were going on. This is actually a picture from a 1952 fire. The most recent fire they have is 1969. No one got any pictures of it. But um, sort of millions of dollars of damage in um, property and different things like that occurring there. Um, and this became a, a sparking factor for people to say that water pollution was something that really needed to be addressed. And then, Love Canal in the late 1970s. So Love Canal is a, in a neighborhood in Niagara uh, Falls, New York. And there had been a chemical com company early there in the 1900s and they buried 22,000 tons of toxic waste in a neighborhood or in a field, which later became a residential neighborhood with a school there. Um, and they built uh, lots of housing on top. And in the 1970s, residents began reporting health problems and chemical waste began to bubble up through the ground um, surface. And uh, birth defects, they saw a rise in birth defects in the households. Um, Love Canal became a national media event, and President Carter declared Love Canal a disaster site, and they did an emergency evacuation of residents there. So these environmental disasters, along with many others, led to the creation of the EPA to address some of these concerns. So we have a 1970. Um, the EPA, which is paired with a growing understanding that human and environmental health needed to be protected and remediated from the damages of pollution. Um, and so that was developed in 1970. Out of the EPA comes CERCLA, which is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. That's commonly known as Superfund. So Superfund program is the CERCLA Act there. And that's designed to fund the cleanup um, of some of the nation's most contaminated areas. And the goal is to protect human health and the environment by managing this cleanup um, and making sure that there are clean places where people can live, work, and um, live and work in healthy, vibrant places, as you can see. The EPA nationwide has tracked uh, more than 530,000 sites in nearly 23 million acres um, across the US, which is about the size of Indiana, to put it in comparison. These sites compose a variety of health and environmental hazards from mining waste, industrial and chemical waste, water pollution, air pollution, across the board, they represent a lot of different um, waste and pollutions. The EPA obviously cannot address all of those spots, so what they did is they created a hazard ranking system for the chemicals and the hazards they see there, and created a national priorities list, which is at the bottom, the NPL, which I'll talk about, um, which focuses on the most dangerous of waste sites. There are over 1,700 sites that have been placed on the MPL since it was started in the early 1980s. And you can kind of see here the red ones are the ones currently on the MPL. The um, yellow are proposed sites. This is a little old, but proposed sites. And the green are deleted. So not quite 400 have been cleaned up and removed from the MPL in this process. So there's about 1,388 left currently on the site. This is a massive governmental program. All states have NPL sites on it, have Superfund sites on it, and um, it includes dense urban settings to remote rural settings. In 2015, the EPA study of these sites found that 53 million people, or about 17% of the U.S. population, live within three miles of a Superfund site. You live within three miles of a Superfund site. There's one over on North 7th right now, a smaller one, but there's one over there um, on North 7th. Many Superfund sites, however, are located in communities that are minority, low income, linguistically isolated, 
and the residents have less than a high school, edu high school education than the rest of the U.S. population at whole, on whole. So they have already some strikes against them as far as communities that are trying to thrive and survive, and then they are near or in Superfund super sites. Um, a lot of them are abandoned industrial sites, landfills, and military depots. Those are some of the most toxic ones. The EPA across the board um, cautions against assuming that because you live on or near a Superfund site that you'll have higher health risk. However, there has been research done that, sound, that found that higher cancer rates can be connected to a lot of different Superfund sites. In the bottom corner, I have a, a picture of, or a map from the Montana Department of Environmental Quality, the DEQ. Uh, the federal Superfund sites in Montana, there are 17 um, currently listed on Montana right now. So Superfund is a huge program, as I say. Who's gonna pay for all this cleanup this, um, that they're focusing to do? The Superfund site, or Superfund program that was created, the goal was, and still is, to get PRP, potentially responsible parties, to pay. So the ones that they can track back in any way to pollution that they can make any connection to, um, and negotiate with them to either do the cleanup themselves or to have them pay an outside party to do the cleanup. If the PRP can't or won't pay, then the EPA can pursue that through uh, federal courts to try and make them pay. In 1980, when this was established, the Superfund program had a number of taxes on the industry, petroleum, chemical, and corporate taxes to help fund this program, but all of those taxes expired in 1995. And so congressional funding is now generally how Superfund is paid, um, but we see some drastic reductions in Superfund. Uh, payments over the last 20 years, con congressional appropriations have decreased from $2 billion to $1.1 billion. And the Washington Post reported recently that over the past 20 years, American taxpayers have spent more than $21 billion on cleanup and oversight costs for Superfund sites, while responsible companies have paid little to anything for those. So that's super fun in a nutshell. We're gonna come back to that in a second. But let's move on to my two favorite sites in the state currently, Butte, of course, being the first one. So great picture of Butte here. I'm sure you all know um, Butte has quite a history with mining and toxic waste we're gonna talk about. Um, at the turn of the last century, Butte was known as the biggest and wildest town between Minneapolis, Denver, and um, San Francisco. The gold rush in Butte sort of mirrored the gold rush, rush everywhere. People came early on, they sort of did placer mining or mining in streams, mining with water. That petered out pretty quickly. And then um, by, by 1880, generally, and then it moved over to hard rock mining, of which silver mining was the first focus of that, and then quickly moved to copper. Um, Marcus Daly, as you all probably know, who was one of the copper kings, found the largest deposit of copper sulfide that the world had ever seen in Butte. And in August 1885, a promotional brochure from the Pacific Coast reckoned that the largest and busiest and richest mining camp in the world today is Butte, Montana. Butte, or Butte and copper become essential to the industrialization of America. Copper had been an important metal for cultures since the Iron Age. People had uh, used it. But it became a global commodity in the 19th century for its high co conductivity and it made it essential to the rapid spread of electricity and electrical appliances across the nation. From 1883 until the 1980s, so 100 years, the United States led all other nations in copper production. <coughs> copper usage exploded with this electricity and industrialism, and Butte became the center of copper production in the United States. According to proud Butte residents, during World War I, there was copper found in all the bullets that helped the um, U.S. help the Allies to win, and a lot of that copper came from Butte, Montana. Um, the copper ore mined in the Butte Mining District in 1910 alone totaled 284 million pounds at the time. Butte was the largest producer of copper in North America and was only really challenged by South Africa during those years. It's not just Butte alone that we have. Of course, we have um, Butte, where the copper mines are, and in the next valley over, we have Anaconda, where the um, smelter is as well, too. So combined, these um, two, sort of, the mining and the smelting, led to Butte, of course, becoming known as the richest hill on Earth, which has led to it being the largest Superfund site in the nation. So Butte goes big, 
when it goes. <laughs> and it has a legacy of air, soil, and water pollution extensively in this area. View also changed how it mined. So, um, it, you know, with any mining community, you have the ups and downs of mining production, the cost of mining. And by the 1950s, that hard rock mining going down in the mines of Butte really was not, no longer economically viable. So um, they turned to open pit mining or strip mining at this time. So in 1955, they created the pit, the Berkeley pit, the red area you can see up there. The Continental pit is still being mined now, but the Berkeley pit we all know, and that's this picture here. And instead of tunneling down anymore, they just took off entire hillsides to carve down into that. Over 1 billion tons of ore was mined from the pit in less than 30 years. In 1982, the pit was no longer producing viable, economically viable copper like the mines had problems with. So Arco, the company at the time, turned off the pumps in view and um, started to see some really negative repercussions from that decision that we're dealing with today. Um, basically right now in the pit, which is the most current picture here, there's estimated 43 billion gallons of water in the pit and rising at 2.5 million gallons each day. This is a great picture here. This is a, a computer model of what it looks like underground in Butte. Those red lines going down are the mines, the hard rock mines that went down. That black area, that divot, is the pit. And then you can see the mines. There are over 500 mines in Butte, over um, 10,000 miles of mines underground. So Arco shuts off, um, you know, they've not worked in hard mines anymore. They shut off the um, pumps they've been using to keep the pit dry, and you're seeing the water fill up through these mines and come into the pit. And so um, that's really the problem that you start to have. <laughs> so you get a huge pit filled with toxic water, and there's a number of problems that comes out, come out of that. Probably the one most of us are familiar with are the issues with snow geese. We had the snow geese land in 1995. Um, if you don't remember that far back, and there were almost 350 carcasses removed, geese carcass removed from the pit. They were flying over in winter and needed a place to rest and came down and landed on the water in um, the pit. Um, and after that, there were a number of deterrents that, that were created to keep those geese away, to protect the geese. However, what you don't realize when you look at the pit in pictures or even when you're there is how huge it is. And it's 450 acres across the size of the pit there. And so in 2016, we had a repeat of that, unfortunately, where 10,000 snow geese landed, same, same thing, caught up in a sort of winter blizzard, land on the pit, and three to 4,000 estimated um, died in the process there. And unfortunately, that many people found around you as well as they tried to fly away. Um, there's been work done to try and resolve this. Montana Resources is the local mining company that's mining the Continental um, pit next door and is responsible for keeping the pit here going or to keep it keep an eye on it and they've come up with a number of um, technological innovations you can see here drones lasers fireworks they shoot shotguns over to try and keep the birds basically haze them off the water and um, that 2016 diop really um, pushed people to come up with some new ideas to take care of that to help out with the geese but the rising water really is a concern for that. So when you look at this slide here, um, there's a critical level where you can see the red line, where the water from the pit will start flowing into the groundwaters. The pit will pull up the toxic water and they'll start connecting into the groundwaters around Butte. We're about 67 feet from that mark right now. And the estimates say, um, right now, if nothing's done, we would reach that mark in 2023. Um, Montana Resources, again, the people who are mining um, the Continental Pit, um, have, you've probably heard about this in the news, it's recent, but has submitted a plan to begin pumping and treating the Berkeley Pit water, so the water out of the pit, um, in 2019. The goal is to slow down, or hopefully, ultimately halt the rising waters in the pit. Um, they want to start with 3 million gallons of water each day, and move up to eventually 7 million gallons of water each day. The goal is to neutralize this water, this toxic water, I won't go through the process, but send it to their tailing ponds, and eventually it makes it down to the stream there. Um, the process of doing that, completely for Montana resources, allows them to extract a lot of copper that's left over in that toxic water mess right there. And so they hope to recover 100,000 100, pounds of copper a month through this process for doing it. 
Um, when the goal was originally set, they were told they had five years to do it. They did it in two. And um, they like to trumpet it because they care about um, making sure that these people are protecting their water, and I'm sure that's part of it. Although the 100,000 pounds of copper that they're going to get out of it, I'm sure played a force in why they made that, why they worked so hard at that. One of their representatives, I love this quote, said, "For 30 years we've we've watched the pit control the groundwater. It's time we show we can control the pit." So they're very optimistic in how that's going to work out. Butte Superfund, as you can see, is a huge. If you know Montana, we have Butte going down to almost Missoula is a Superfund site. Um, many ideas have come up. We saw how to deal with the geese in the pit, how to deal with some of the pit waters. These are sort of local industry, and a lot of times local industry does get involved in designing technology to deal with Superfund places. But the vast size of this as a Superfund site, it's not going to be viable for any one company or organization to figure out how to handle this. And that's where you're going to see the federal government come in under Superfund to do this. Um, they're going to be focused on human health, and environmental health in this process. So during the century of large-scale mining operations, as I said, there were over 500 underground mines in Butte, and Anaconda, of course, had the smelter there with multiple <coughs> stacks sending um, toxic smoke into the air. And um, particularly arsenic was the big one through that. Um, when you go back to Butte now, you still see the head frames. They celebrate that mining heritage in Butte. Um, and the pit, of course, has become the largest physical remnant of that mining period. Um, and all of this led to Butte being on the first group of sites dedicated for the NPL, the National Priorities List. So they were on the first list in 1983. As I said, they're the largest Superfund site in the nation. And they came about because the local health department workers running routine tests on water and residents' wells were finding arsenic in the water. So it became a, a pretty um, um, dangerous issue in the year. It's led to multiple Superfund sites connected that run from Uptown Butte to the Milltown Dam. Um, generally, uh, Butte, Superfund was not um, overwhelmingly, um, people weren't excited to see Superfund when it first came to Butte, but anecdotally in talking to people in Butte, they said once the science started coming out about the toxins and arsenic, people realized just with the scope that Superfund was a necessity there. Over 600 acres of land have already been remediated through Superfund. Um, there's still arguments in Butte today over adding new areas and um, making um, Superfund bigger or changing the scope of Superfund there. So that's Butte. You're all familiar with Butte. You might be less familiar with Libby. Libby is, you can see on that little map of Montana there, in the far northwest corner of the state. Something I discovered this summer is it takes as long to drive to Libby, Montana from Bozeman as it does to drive to Sydney. So it's quite a drive to get up there. <laughs> and the last census population you can see for Libby is just under 3,000 people. There are just under 20,000 or 19,000 people in the county, which means that it qualifies for frontier status, according to the federal government still. And Libby is a place where its heritage is really dependent on natural resources. Logging, mining, ranching, agriculture. That's how the people in Libby in that county define themselves. As a matter of fact, if you ever have a chance to go to a football game for the Libby Loggers up in Libby, whenever they score a touchdown, um, their, their fans have removed the chains from chainsaws, but they start up the chainsaws and they're all like, rrr, 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 whenever they score. It's quite exciting. Very throwback to old times. So the mining in Libby is sort of what I want to focus on now. But the mining started with gold, like it did it pretty much everywhere in the West, and there was some silver. But really, that continues intermittently until the 20th century. <coughs> and in 1923, a product or, or um, an element called vermiculite is found in Libby. And that is found to be resistant to fire and chemical, um, chemical corrosion. And it really becomes popular in insulation um, and, um, what do I say, insulation and uh, fire resistance, I guess what I want to say. Uh, it becomes the biggest employer for citizens, the vermiculite mine there. And between 1919 and 1990, Libby vermiculite is distributed across the nation. W.R. Grace is the eventual company that buys this mine in the 1960s, and they process nearly 200,000 tons of vermiculite from Libby Mine each year until the mine ceased operations in 1990. Um, so vermiculite is a big focus. The issue with vermiculite is not vermiculite. The issue is that vermiculite contains asbestos. And asbestos across the board 
part is not always bad. There are Chytrobus festa, our little cur curly cue, if you look at them under a microscope. Those are pretty harmless. But the vermiculite asbestos is very toxic. It is shaped like the little arrows, and when people would breathe it in, it goes straight into their lung lining and doesn't come back out. And it is an extremely toxic form of asbestos. And that's what they were mining in Libby. So Libby has a very different experience with mining and public health and Superfund than Butte does. A very different experience. Um, the mining in Butte led to some toxic landscapes and water and soil, and with the smelter, was, you know, from the smelter, you're gonna see some of that. But in Libby, you have this asbestos that causes asbestosis, which is a disease that causes lung disease. And that's what happens to the people in Libby. So you can see here, here's the mine area. It's about six miles outside of Libby. And in crushing the ore to get the vermiculite so that they can use it, it set billions of asbestos fibers loose in clouds of dust that had drifted six miles down to Libby. Um, in addition, they had facilities in Libby. The lower left-hand corner are these what they call popping plants. And so they take the vermiculite there after they break it out of the ore. They take the vermiculite and they heat it to very hot temperatures and it pops just like popcorn and it looks like that top uh, slide there. And um, that is used for insulation. It's very light, it's very porous, and it's a great insulative, has great insulative qualities. And so in Libby, they would pop that. You can see that popping there. And then in addition, they would take the ore, they would take over the leftover vermiculite they weren't using, and they'd put it on playgrounds and the baseball field and the parks. Um, the workers at the mine would come home covered in dust, and their um, wives and family members would be exposed to the dust when they'd shake it out. They'd bring home bags of it and put it in their gardens because it could be used for soil conditioning. So it was really spread throughout the community. And the population, um, the pollution, sorry, associated there, sorry, pollution there has been associated with more than 400 deaths from the Libby mine and more than 1,500 people in Libby, which you saw the population overall was less than 3,000, um, have been diagnosed with issues from the asbestos there and the exposure to asbestos. The other terrible issue about this is because um, this form of lung cancer can take 40 years to show up. We're not done seeing the issues of people. That mine operated until 1990, and people, until 2002, it was still in the area. So we're gonna see people having that. Another um, scary aspect of that is the role of this um, Libby vermiculite, this asbestos. So um, as I said, it was a loose asbestos. If you have an older home, it might be the fill in your attic to keep in for insulation there. And for almost 70 years, Libby produced much of the world's supply of vermiculite, and that's what it was used for, insulation. Um, and it, so it was spread throughout the nation. Uh, in 1968, W.R. Grace removed from, um, or changed from producing house insulation, that light fluffy insulation, to a spray-on insulation that be, could be used on high-rise construction buildings. And so as the high-rise boom occurred in the 70s and 80s, um, the estimates are that three to four hundred, or that vermiculite spread that way across the nation, and at the World Trade Center alone, three to four hundred tons of asbestos fires, fires were used in the building of the World Trade Center. Um, historian Brett Walker states that by the 1980s, Libby asbestos would spread throughout the buildings and bodies throughout the nation. In fact, when the Twin Towers came down on September 11th, um, it released this huge toxic cloud across Manhattan, and um, dust, debris, and hazardous asbestos fire, fibers and other substances were released into the air. Um, and the, the scientists found that the concentrations of asbestos that inside Libby homes was the same um, or comparable to levels found on inside buildings in Lower Manhattan. So it really infiltrated the area. According to Walker, Libby's vermiculite has its own history, one that follows the creation of, in geologic times and its movement from a small Montana town through the bodies of local residents to the steel columns of the Twin Towers and into the bodies of New Yorkers. So you can see this connection between Libby, Montana, a town of less than 3,000, um, and New York City. The World Trade Center Health Registry estimates about 410,000 people were exposed to a host of toxins, or a host of toxins including asbestos during the rescue, recovery and cleanup effect, um, efforts that occurred after 9-11. And most people who were affected were the people who were helping other people at that time. Because of the latency of the cancer, the ex expectation is we will see a sharp increase in 9-11 related cancers over the next 30 years. 
So let's go back to Libby. Um, the Superfund site there, because of that health crisis, Libby sought, which really sort of became public in the 1990s, Libby sought Superfund status in 2002, and it was quickly placed on the NPL, the danger was seen there. The focus is on, has been on removing asbestos from outdoor and indoor spaces in Libby. In 2009, for the first time in history, the EPA um, declared a public health emergency in Libby to provide federal health care assistance for the victims of asbestos-related diseases. And one of the big things they did is they have this beautiful building um, right near downtown now called CARD. It's the Center for Asbestos-Related Diseases. And that was built with money from this public health emergency to put information into the hands of people who live in Libby and um, have doctors who can check them out. Um, like many toxic communities, um, business people in 2000 were worried about the idea of having Libby call the Superfund community, worried about the damage to their reputation, but the health emergency really just overrode all of our concerns at that time. Um, and really, the community really focused on governmental resources to help them through this process. The total cost so far for remediation and reclamation in Libby has been $600 million. WR Grace has paid about $250 million of that. Um, this, this asbestos, as I said, is in um, insulation in buildings. The EPA now advises home, American homeowners to take extreme caution. If you see that loose filling in your attic, they uh, think over three million homes might have that loose filling in it across the nation. <coughs> so let's talk a little about um, the EPA and Superfund and sort of move it to um, something I started with, which is Colorado. So as I said, 1,700 sites on the NPL, uh, over half a million sites of concern. Um, I want to focus a little on Col Colorado. This isn't a great slide, and I apologize for the quality, but basically in Colorado alone, I'm going to cut back down to mining now, there are 23,000 abandoned <coughs> mines in Colorado. The Denver Post in 2015 published an article, so after that spill, the Annapolis River spill, um, said that there are, over, there are 230 um, mines leaking heavy metals laced water into Colorado's rivers. And they said that the, over effect, sorry, the overall effect of those 230 mines um, combined equals that disaster at the beginning, the Gold King mine disaster, every two days in Colorado. That's the amount of toxins that are being dumped into the rivers from those abandoned mines. It's spreading cadmium, copper, lead, arsenic, manganese, zinc, and other contaminants and they've affected over 1,600 miles of river in Colorado. So where is Silverton? Where is um, Superfund now? So as I uh, mentioned, the, the um, feelings against EPA <coughs> in Silverton were very negative after the spill, and they were very negative before the spill. This town of 600 had actively fought Superfund designation for 20 years. So the EPA had come in multiple times trying to make deals, trying to put them on the NPL. They can't just um, um, force NPL designation. The community has to be part of the process. And Superfund did not want that for a variety of reasons. There were concerns that it would affect, you know, with the closure of mines, they're really focused on the tourist economy. They're afraid that it would affect the tourist economy if they went on the NPL. And that regulations would prevent future mining in the area if it came back that future mining could be done there. Um, the local community started an Animus River Stakeholders Group in 1994 as a way to handle their own issues of remediation and reclamation and to um, address environmental damage caused by abandoned mines in their immediate areas, not the whole state, but their area. And those um, had, that group had representatives from the, it's pretty interesting, it had representatives from the community, from mining companies, landowners, environmental groups, and local, state, and federal governmental representatives. So they all worked together um, working on remediation in the area. And they did have some local success. Um, they spent millions of dollars in the local area. However, once the Animus River spill, and spill happened, and the real anger at the EPA sort of died down um, from that, it revealed the limitations of what could be done through local groups there. Um, Really, the vast um, spread of the spill, or, or sorry, of the spill, um, made the residents of Silverton and their leaders recognize that without federal intervention, they are not going to clean up that area. The damage is just too vast, and raising funds on their own or getting grants and local monies is not going to be able to affect the change that they want to affect. 
So um, while some residents of the area are concerned that if, um, as the area becomes super fun, they will be left out of the decision making process. In August of 2016, the EPA, or this, sorry, the residents did petition their governor to request to be put on the NPL. And they have been put on the NPL because of the scope of the problem there is so vast. So that's sort of where um, Silverton sits now. And I like to uh, sort of wrap up as we are looking ahead on that at Silverton because it is you know, a place that was very resistant to the EPA coming in and just a, a, some rocks setting off a spill there revealed to them that the damage is so widespread that they just are not going to be able to accept it on their own. And the government plays an important role in supplying the funding and the ability for these communities to even attempt to recover from environmental degradation. So I showed you that map of Colorado with over 23,000 abandoned mines. We have a similar one from Montana, of course. So abandoned landmines in Montana. Uh, I mean, you can't see the heat on here, but the coal is the orange ones on the eastern side of the state mostly and the hard rock is on the western side of the state. I didn't find an exact number. However, um, nationally, uh, they're estimated that there are as many as 500,000 abandoned mines in the nation. And so when you see, um, and they're all over the nation. You know, when you head out east, it's gonna be um, coal mines and different areas like that, not just what we see out west as well too. So you have Butte as an abandoned mine, you have Libby, um, it's filling with water. You have Libby that was a mine that was closed because of its toxicity. Both of these have been affected through environmental degradation and have, been, have affected human health as well too. So, right on time. Where I sort of wanted to finish tonight was sort of throwing out some thoughts um, and questions that I'm mulling over in my head, some things to think about um, as we sort of wrap up where uh, we see these super fun communities and how we're sort of dealing with this contamination and waste in the 21st century. So the big question for historians, and I know there's a lot of historian peers out there, and the most annoying they can, thing they can say is you finish your lecture and they're like, so what? Why does it matter? And I beat you guys to it. Just put it on my slide, right? <laughs> so what? So why does this matter? What, you know, it's, it's fun stories and really graphic images, but why does this matter across the board? So, like, I would say um, super fun communities are sacrificial places. That's an important thing to be keep in mind. Like many industrial areas, hard rock mining um, communities, such as Butte and Libby, are dealing with the legacies of industrialization. Butte's copper mines helped electrify the nation. That goes without dispute. Libby's vermiculite fireproofed the steel beams necessary for building skyscrapers in the 70s and 80s. These materials helped to modernize, industrialize, and urbanize America and turn the nation into an imperial superpower. As a result of these contributions to America's economic, technological, and industrial growth, both these communities, along with many others, um, contend with toxic landscapes and public health concerns. So this um, contributing to um, the power and might of America that we saw rise in the 20th century, these are the communities that are having to deal with the legacies of that. So how do we feel about their role um, and where they stand now as we have entered the 21st century? Um, I talked a little about who's doing work, who can help them, um, or should be helping toxic communities. As I said, there are, um, you know, Montana resources in Butte is figuring out ways to get those toxins out of the water and take that copper back out. You have the Animus River Stakeholders Group that worked for 20 years and they did do good work remediating their local areas and um, trying to make the water and land healthy again. But many Superfund communities are economically depressed. Not all, Aspen is a Superfund community. You know, they're not economically depressed. But when you look at Butte and Libby, those are representative of areas that have lost their um, extractive um, industries, and they're having a hard time competing economically to start with, and then on top of it, their areas of environmental degradation and public health concerns. So where do these responsibilities really come from? Do we look to um, companies like Montana Resources that is trying to keep the geese off of the pit water um, and trying to help with the water rising? I mean, they definitely have economic vested interests in getting that copper out of the water. Great. It made them speed up the process to take it out instead of five years or two years. 
But we saw multiple times in Butte where copper was no longer paying for itself. And we saw the hard rock mines abandoned, we saw the pit abandoned. So when these mining companies aren't seen, um, or industry across the board isn't seen um, the uh, economic feedback from that, where do their loyalties lie? What is the role of government in this? I mean, the EPA in many of these communities is hated, even when they're coming in. And um, they're kind of an unappreciated mediator. They don't do the cleanup themselves. They figure out what areas need to be cleaned up and they pay for the cleanup to occur. But they take a lot of, um, I think, just residual anger that these communities feel when they feel that they've been forgotten or wasted um, in the process of American growth. So, you know, how do we balance what the government can do? As I mentioned on one of the earlier slides, that government money is dwindling. We all are paying for Superfund to happen in these places, $21 billion um, to clean these places. Um, does technology fix our problems? I talked a lot about different technologies, the technologies that made the mines, that allowed us to get the copper, to electrify the nation, to build skyscrapers, all of that is there. And that technology is also really important to fixing the problems we did. The EPA, along with mining companies, fervently believes that the ravages of mining and industry can be overcome through science. You apply science to fix these problems. Technology caused mass destruction on landscapes, we see that, but technology will also fix these landscapes. And Superfund supports, or Superfund supporters believe technolo technological innovation will save society. There is a consistent faith that regardless of the different results wanted and expected by community members, environmentalists, and government officials, technology will um, save what technology has destroyed. And that's great, technology has done so much. But in places like this, if we figure out that we can, um, it would be great to reduce the pit water in view and great if we're getting that copper out of it, but does that mean that we unabated build more, dig more copper mines? We no longer have to worry about the consequences because we can always find some technology to fix it. How does it mean about how we adjust our use of these natural resources if we can always find a way to fix it afterwards? So something I want, uh, I keep in mind, maybe you guys will keep in mind, and then the future of toxic places, I mean, Butte has embraced it, let's be honest. And they have gotten a ton of money um, poured into the community through, from the EPA, through Superfund. So um, in Anaconda, the EPA has four on-site remediation and cleanup businesses. And again, the EPA doesn't do the cleanup, they play other businesses. They employ 60 people there and generates one million in animal sale, sorry, annual sales revenues. And in Butte, there's two on-site businesses that employ 337 people and generates $25 million in annual sales revenue. So that, that Libby doesn't have the stats on that, they're not public to see, but all of these places are benefiting from the EPA money going back into the community because it's those local community members um, and businesses in some cases that are doing the remediation. So when Superfund ends, as it's going to in Libby very, very soon, if I hasn't already and I haven't heard about it. As they look towards moving past that, what does that mean about what these people, I mean, many, many people I talk to in Libby work in remediation. So where will those jobs go when actually it pulls out? And, and that becomes a huge concern in Libby right now. The EPA wants out. They said that they've done their job on remediation. They've cleaned, cleaned the area that they think is safe. The people in Libby have two arguments back. They're not sure about um, if they agree it's quite as safe. And secondly, if any future incidents arise, who's gonna pay for it? Once the EPA goes out, it's the state of Montana that's paying for it. So those are things to think about. Um, as these places move into the 21st century, Libby is really focusing on moving past its Superfund's um, MPL status. They're um, positioning themselves as a really big outdoor area, and they've been super successful at that. Uh, at one point I was gonna go up this summer and the hotels, the hotels, the motels in Libby were $185 a night. So they're doing good, um, sort of at least sometimes of the year, as repositioning themselves as sort of this outdoor mecca um, that people can go to. They're really off the beaten trail, but they do have this history of asbestos still in the trees and the homes and the people there. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, Butte. You probably all know about Old Works, the golf course there. That was originally built by Arco as a cap to sort of keep control, keep control over groundwater um, and arsenic that came through the stormwater there. 
And that has been mildly successful at supporting itself. You know, the goal was to sort of help with remediation and boost tourism, <laughs> boost tourist dollars there in Anaconda. Um, however, they recently had to ask the ARCO, uh, the golf course in the communities, for a $7 million subsidy to stay alive for the next 10 years <coughs> for that golf course. So it's not paying for itself in any way, and they're really struggling to keep that afloat as a recreational destination. Um, and then at the end of that long picture of the Superfund site in Butte, you have Milltown Dam, which was removed, which is a, quite an amazing feat. The letters that were written on that um, into the EPA were the most ever written on any Superfund site ever, was about that dam removal. And so when that was removed, um, over 300,000 tons of heavy materials were taken out of that dam area, and a 600-acre state park has been created. Um, uh, whose name is escaped me, an author recently wrote a book called Restoring the Shining Water, specifically about the Milltown um, dam removal and the remediation done there, and he declared it was one, one of the rare environmental success stories that we know of. So that one is a nice one to look at. Um, and I said Libby has its own issues, but they, that hopping plant that I showed you, they've made a city park there, so working to sort of position themselves for the 21st century. And the last thing I want to touch on briefly is really where my interests lie in this whole process is environmental justice and injustice. So as we look at environments and pollution, waste, and who's in power and who's not, as we all know, at least instinctually, there are disproportionate level, levels of pollution affecting different peoples. And so a lot of that has to do with class, race, ethnicity, Gender, people are affected by that in different ways. And when we, I mentioned earlier on that 53 million people, or about 17% of the US population, live within three miles of a Superfund site. I said at that time that that tends to be lower income, people of color, uh, people who English may not be their um, first language, uh, they um, don't have high school educations or barely made high school educations across the board. And these are the people who tend to suffer the most um, through this process of toxic waste. And so I'm interested in sort of examining that. As an aside, if you expand the idea of Superfund sites, which the EPA does, to brownfield sites, those are sites of, get this right, um, areas that are the responsibility of state and tribal governments where economic development um, can't occur yet, so they have to be cleaned up to have economic development and industrial um, um, investment there. That extends the range of people li living within a super three miles of a Superfund site or Brownfield site to 51% of the US population or 156 million people. So there, I didn't show you a map of that, but that really covers uh, the United States. So um, these communities, I said in these areas, are um, reservations, they're poor, they're black, they're Hispanic, um, and they don't have a lot of opportunities for um, other means of income, because like Libby, the mine's closed. So that's really where I'm interested in looking at. So that's where I want to leave you all with tonight. I do want to say um, a thank you to all of you again for coming out, and especially for Crystal and the Extreme History Project for hosting this. Um, MSU for some funding I've gotten in this research, and of course my committee members here listed. So thank you very much for coming out.